Hello there, I'm Dr. Elizabeth Cook. I am back for episode two in the series around electric utility transformational change. This series is aimed to really weave together the importance of leadership, operational excellence, and public engagement with the technical and business fundamentals of the electric utility. And it is to inspire, but also guide stakeholders through this transformational change that we're all within. Episode two is near and dear to my heart as one of my passions is understanding and talking about what is the electric power grid. I'm gonna start off simple and talk about what is electricity. I do have a background. I have my doctorate in electrical engineering. And I will say, fun fact, after four years of undergrad, I truly did not know that my electrical engineering degree would play such a big part in my overall passion 20 years later. I also did not know what the power grid was after four years of getting an electrical engineering degree. However, it is the study of and the understanding of the theory and the mathematical equations around electricity. How we have developed a language, a universal language, to understand the flow of electrons. It is the extraction of taking an electron from an atom and putting it or propelling it across a conduit to create the transfer of heat, transfer of light, aka the transfer or the rate at which electrons flow. You can use any of those languages, trying not to be too technical, but realize that what we have done through actually hundreds of years of experimentation is develop machines or systems that can not only take off one electron, but millions of electrons and distribute it across what we know as the power grid to serve us electricity 24-7, 365. So that's a lot. And I remember I was asked after I got my degree by my father, well, what is electricity? So maybe I've been on a journey since to be able to explain this phenomena in ways that all can understand. So one thing to learn and understand is at the time of conception, where those that went before us, such as Thomas Edison, George Westinghouse, some of the founding fathers of the grids that we know today, understood how to build the machine and distribute these electrons through a conduit, such as wires, and light up light bulbs, just like the ones behind me. From that awareness grew the need and desire for more of these light bulbs, from individual homes to large commercial industrial entities, such as lighting up the railroad yards, creating the second industrial revolution where we were developing steel here in my born and raised town, city of Pittsburgh. Through that enablement of making the day the day, the night, the night, but also electricity started to light up our nights, creating the massive ability to produce all that we kind of have our fingertips on today. So it went from electrifying one building to scaling and creating and electrifying all of America and the world over the last 100 years. Something that happened from that design was the grid as itself is made up of four components one can think of. It's the bulk generation plants that have been designed and really scaled from really the turn of the century to the 1960s, 70s, when they optimized the, the vast amount, so the size, as well as the efficiency of the size, to create enough power to light hundreds of thousands, if not millions of homes. Then there is the transmission grid, which is the high voltage, when we say voltage in the world of electricity, it is the pressure of which the electrons are under when they're moving through the conduit that we've created. So the transmission system has a voltage level of anything above 69,000 volts. Our grid in itself is standardized on multiple levels of transmission voltage. But well, we won't get into those details. But every grid within the grid that is the biggest machine has a different voltage level of transmission based on when it was founded, who were the leaders, who made the decisions to standardize within those assets and territory that they built the grid in. For relative thinking, your 
volts at your plug that you all know and plug into on a daily basis, 120 volts. So we're talking about pressure or voltage high as 500,000 volts is where your transmission system operates. And the transmission grid is made up of many assets that take it from the bulk generation through some circuit breakers like those in your home, down in the basement, your circuit breaker box, which then allows you to distribute those electrons off across many lines into many towns into many homes. However, there's another part of the grid, which is called the distribution grid. This is a lower voltage. And the reason for this is the transmission was designed for three phase, which is a whole other topic, <laughs> but you step it into a substation, it breaks off into a distribution lower voltage because ultimately it's gonna go one step further to be low enough to be taken into your buildings and your homes. The distribution grid is actually operated on a single phase, so one wire, transmission three phased, balanced, distribution one phase, unbalanced. Two totally different microcosms you can think of. How they are studied, developed, designed, and operated is different. And the last fourth component is your customer at the edge of the grid. The edge of the grid is a term that's been popping up in our industry as of lately, but that's where the consumption of or the load is, aka where the system, the whole system, distribution, transmission, bulk generation, must operate to and feed that customer. Something that was not available when the original design of the power grid was something called storing energy for a later time, AKA energy storage. So how the system was developed, designed, specified, standardized, all of it in between, was based on the fact that the amount of electrons being created and extracted and pushed through the conduit must be consumed at the exact same time. So our system has a frequency, a residence, where if it's disrupted, the different assets that are within the transmission and distribution will be sensed or sensing there is a situation and will react. AK, they will open and isolate that current flow to, for the safety of all. The whole system, we've connected it it, first it was individual homes, then cities, then communities, then across state lines, and then really interconnected. Here in the United States, we have three grids per se. You got the Western interconnection, Eastern interconnection, and the grid within Texas. Those three grids are ultimately interlinked through various lines, but they operate as individuals. Over that 140 years, we went ahead and created one of the largest machines in the world and it was designed for one-way power flow. Also at the time when the grids were designed, the ability to measure and sense and then autocorrect or ensure that the asset handles a certain amount of electrons at a certain time, aka the flow, the rate, aka the current, and also within a certain pressure, aka voltage. So every asset has a certain rating that it must operate within. So the whole grid itself must produce the same amount of electrons and consume while maintaining all of the ratings of the assets that are touched. At the time when this happened, the ability to measure it and then communicate it to other devices was very limited. However, we did have the telephone service. So the ability for each substation that had control over those breakers, similar to the one in your home, but now very large breakers, would have men controlling based on phone calls. We had thousands of connected devices and over time and where we are today, we now have millions and we also have something called the internet or fiber. Various ways to communicate the real-time operation of each asset and that means the real time of a current that is flowing at this moment, as well as the voltage that is being seen. And so we've been able, since really the 70s and 80s when computers became available and the internet took off, is bring all of those systems together and see the system holistically and operate the transmission from a network perspective. We've also introduced the idea of two-way power flow of the transmission grid. 
because it's networked. And we decided in the late 70s, early 80s, that the grids, the transmission grids, become more reliable if they're tied together with their neighbor owner. So we've seen this. However, the distribution grid is typically, as I said earlier, single phase, one wire, unbalanced from the hub, the substation. So that system itself has only seen one-way power flow. However, because of all the new technology that we've been hearing about, the evolution of battery energy storage, that key element that wasn't available 140 years ago, is able to store energy for a later time. We also have developed, created, and made intermittent generation available, aka on-site generation, to our customers at the edge via solar. We also have the capability and scalableness of even on-site dispatchable generation, such as your micro turbines or your gas generators that large homes or businesses do have, such as all hospitals must have backup generation to secure that reliable power to the hospitals, right? And the most recent is our electric vehicles and the charging thereof. Where we are today is we have a significant amount of use cases. We have utilities and we have grids that have enabled and enacted the technology and the information systems to be able to manage this proliferation. However, we as a larger machine are at various maturity states in regards to the adoption of these technologies and the IT systems that are required for gaining access to this real-time information. However, we have today communication systems that can connect millions of devices. The next step and where we need to be is the reality that our communication systems need to be taken back in regards to having accessibility and the ability to transfer significant amount of data, more than a lot of our minds can actually conceptualize, and connecting billions of devices. So the bandwidth or the ability to identify what is happening in real time at the edge of the grid back to the mothership is a necessity to unlock the current capability of the grid as well as enabling the future of the grid. And this is where the whole transformational leadership discussion steps in. What we want to do and what is reality is have the use case or the data to eliminate or reduce the risk show the value, either monetarily or qualitatively. However, we're in a catch-22. There are many vendors and enablers and technologies that are trying to identify the best fit. And so if we don't think outside the box with the idea that what we do today will give us the ability to set up for a future reality that we have yet to even imagine, then we are kind of stalled in enacting and enabling the transformation that we all have been discussing, which is allowing the various new devices, be it at the bulk generation, new energy sources, all of the various equipment that actually transfers the electrons from transmission distribution down to the home, and then allowing our customers to have more of a awareness of how they use energy and when, with all of the new devices that are becoming available to them. To summarize, from a understanding of where the grid is to where the grid is going, and it is actually happening in real time. You can be in a different state and actually believe that it is not happening based on wherever your utility space sits, or you can be in another state and see all of it happening. So that in itself is an awareness of being a leader that is observing correlating and understanding why those went before and those are still not moving. It becomes a necessity to be that leader within the operational excellence space that we don't know the answers, but the best step forward is surrounding ourselves with all of those different ideas, those voices, and really going back to episode one, transformational leadership. So traditional grid, bulk generation, the available resources that were available 140 years ago. Now we have some mix of newer energy sources that became available maybe 50, 60 years ago, but they've had a hard time of having those discussions to allow them to connect to the transmission grid. 
Then the transmission grid shoots to the distribution one way, serves customers. And to kind of bring it full circle, we're going from that framework, which quite frankly, it has capability and capacity that we have yet to untap or unlock because we're still considering and thinking about the systems, the computational power, the design, the way to actually calculate your power flow solutions based on that old reality. So a transformation in itself needs to occur to literally unlock and understand what the current performance is with all of this new technology let alone realizing that the work you do based on your current grid and the assets thereof will allow you an unlock insight into where it can go. But until we deploy the censoring, the measuring, the communication networks and gathering the data and having a strategy of driving those analytics to your current utility function, you will not be able to understand the baseline performance to even get to that future reality. So you have all of that happening, and then you have the new technologies I spoke of, the on-site energy sources, such as solar, battery, and whatever else may come. You have the charging infrastructure. You have smart thermostats, and the ability for humans, those that use the energy, to relieve the control and allow algorithms to help them use less energy at certain times of the day, which ultimately, if done at large scale, can be seen as a generation source or a dispatchable load. So you have the enactment of battery energy storage across CNI, commercial industrial, and residential. So you're going from a one-way power flow to a two-way power flow, and you're creating multiple other stakeholders, such as those that can develop and create an energy transactive market that we have yet to even unleash, which if you think about an energy market is how we trade and sell electrons. So it used to be bulk generation, trade and sold on the transmission, shipped to the distribution. We've developed a retail market, which ultimately is for the distribution system for these new devices. But what if we bring it all together? That is a reality that we are challenged with and moving towards. So becoming the aggregator of aggregators to ensure that the distribution grid that now has all of these technologies playing on it remains safe, reliable, affordable, sustainable, and resilient. Just to summarize, that is a lot, but thinking back on episode one and understanding that each one of those four components are going through a dynamic change. And it is a complex system that has been set in standards and specifications over the last 100 years. What we can do as the producers of, and then ultimately the consumers there of the electrons, is realize and understand this extensive network and be a part of the conversation instead of a deterrent. Understanding the reality of where we are, baselining our performance, developing the processes of transmitting the data as well as the electrons from a actionable perspective. And finally, us as users of this electrical source realize that we can have access to devices or technology that enables us to use energy more wisely. Not in a way that hinders our lives, but actually helps our lives. So all four of those components are dynamically changing. And that is why the gap between what is and how we've operated the grid to what we need to be as the leaders that's transforming the grid embrace transformational mindset, and operational excellence.